the radiant throng. <laughs> There's some words in these hymns, when we sing them, I think, what does that mean? <laughs> Part of the radiant throng. I guess it's talking about being in heaven and we're going to just be glowing. <laughs> and uh, one of the other songs was had a verse about singing in heaven, and I'm looking forward to that. You know, I, I miss my voice. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny, you know, how as you get older, things change. And one of the things that's changed about me is I sing different. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to heaven. And, you know, even if you can't hold a tune here on earth, I think you're going to enjoy singing in heaven, and we're going to enjoy hearing you. It's going to be a blessing. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 8 tonight. Uh, intermittently, I've been doing a series of sermons called Key Chapters of the Bible. You may or may not have even been aware of that because it hasn't been week by week. And uh, the last one for this year is Romans chapter 8. Now, key chapters of the Bible, of course, would be a very personal thing to uh, different ones would think uh, one is more key than another. Uh, but Romans chapter 8, uh, I don't think anybody would, would leave out. It's a, it's a real blessing. Uh, if you want a challenge, memorize Romans chapter 8. And I think you'll find it a, a real encouragement to you in, in times of trial. We, we looked at more or less the first third or the first half last week. And we saw as it starts in Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And, and we need to understand that. We need to believe that. Uh, Christ took our condemnation. The other thing we saw was that we're not under any obligation to the flesh. Verse 12, he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. It, you know, there's so much that our flesh pulls at us and, and wants us to do this and wants us to do that. Listen, we have every right to say no <laughs> to the flesh. We don't have to do what it says anymore. It's not the boss anymore. We've died to that. And, and we talked especially about uh, where are you spiritually? Like he talks about in verse 9, there's two basic places where we are spiritually. Verse 9, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. There's two basic situations in our relationship with God. Either we have the Holy Spirit or we don't have the Holy Spirit. And God says he doesn't give the spirit in measure. <laughs> you don't get a little bit of the spirit. You either have the Holy Spirit or you don't. And having the Holy Spirit is salvation. It's not some second blessing. It's not something you have to work at. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God takes up residence in you. And it's particularly God the Holy Spirit. Now, there's only one God, so it's God. It's God the Son. It's God the Holy Spirit. God has, has uh, made uh, an, Himself a part of your life when you trust Christ as your Savior. Uh, we looked at a third relationship. Does the Spirit have you? Just going on from the new birth to victorious Christian living. Uh, you know, like uh, I mentioned the verse, I think it was in... Maybe it wasn't that verse, 1 Corinthians 16, 15, where he talks about people that, that are addicted, have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Uh, just going on and, and being a part of what God is doing uh, in this world. So, uh, no condemnation, no obligation to the flesh. And then we get to Romans chapter 8 and um, verses 18 and following. And uh, you might say, um, no frustration. Uh, that's probably not the best title, but freedom from discouragement. Let's read starting in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestations of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, th those are kind of hard words, but he's just saying uh, our creation is under the curse of sin right now. But we live in hope because we know that God has a purpose and a plan and a place, and you know, he's taking care of eternity. Um, go on there in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, 
which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Uh, I'll just stop reading there. Uh, he talks about some groans there, first of all. We know about groaning. <laughs> uh, you know, human beings understand. Uh, there's just times when uh, life is, is a struggle. And the Bible says our whole world groans under the curse of sin. That's what he's talking about there in verse 22. The whole cre creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. If you've ever gone through an earthquake, you know exactly what, what he's talking about, even the sound of it. Uh, you know, the fires that are going on, the, the sicknesses that are, that are around us, you know, just the difficulties of life. It's because Adam and Eve chose to sin, and Adam all die. You know, and our world's been dying ever, ever since. Uh, creation groans. But folks, this world is not our home if we're saved. Uh, th this is not, we used to sing a song, uh, I, I love, and you'd put the name of your, your ch church in there, I love Fellowship Baptist Church, but heaven is better than this. <laughs> yeah, we have a great church, but I, I'll guarantee it, folks, heaven is better than this. And uh, creation groans, believers groan. It talks about in verse 23. We groan within ourselves. Uh, listen, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we don't have struggles. Uh, there's suffering, uh, there's sin that we struggle with, there's death. At uh, the time when you read Jesus wept, he was at the grave of a, of a loved one. Uh, you know, there's groaning. But he, he mainly says there, we groan within ourselves, verse 23, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We groan because we know that God has something better beyond this. Uh, it's kind of like, it, kind of like kids waiting for Christmas. Oh, can't we open the presents today? Why can't? Oh, <laughs> we know there's something better beyond, and we know that this is not it. <laughs> you know, this world isn't our home. This isn't the, the end all for what we're, we're doing. Uh, there's some verses that we, we learned in that uh, study, Quieting the Noisy Soul, that, that really bring this home. 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 16, he says, for which cause we faint not. Talk about the, the troubles. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now that's what in Romans he talks about, it's hope. You, you know, we're not in heaven yet. There, there's still things that we don't have a grasp on. Uh, the things that are are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The next chapter, he says, for we know that if our earthly house, this, this tabernacle, this body, were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. There, there's groaning that we go through, but uh, we have hope in the Lord. There's just so many verses, I'd love to, to share them all. Philippians 3.20, uh, our conversation, our manner of life is, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Listen, the struggles we're going through in our bodies, they're going to be past. We'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. Uh, in, in Titus chapter 2 and, and verse 13, he makes this statement, looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't know what all you are going through, but I can guarantee you everybody's going through something. And every one of us can have hope in the Lord. Uh, we'll grow. Yeah, there'll be some times when you'll just grow. I mean, physically, sometimes you'll grow. Mentally, uh, all kinds of ways. But we don't want to stay there. We don't want to, uh, to just groan. Uh, we want to be trusting the Lord. Uh, we have hope. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that brings us to the next point. The Holy Spirit groans. <laughs> you know, some people confuse this passage and think we, we have to groan in our prayers. No, it, it says in verse 26 and 27 there that the Spirit makes intercession for us. The Spirit makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, you know, there's times when you just don't know what to pray. Your heart is moved. You, there's just things on your mind and in your heart, and you don't always just know what to pray, but God says his Holy Spirit will help you. He knows exactly what to pray, and he relates it to God the Father in that way. Uh, verse 27, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. According to the will of God. See, God has a will for us. And his will is that we be like Jesus. Now, God doesn't just say, okay, I want them to be like Jesus. He also has a plan. God always has a plan. <laughs> and we need to understand that. That's what verses 28 and 29 are all about. We know that all things work together for good. See, that follows, uh, he's making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And then he goes into God's plan. So uh, we don't have to be frustrated with, with this world. I mean, you can if you want. <laughs> it won't help. Uh, but we don't have to be. God has a plan. God's working out his plan. Uh, we don't need to be discouraged. Uh, listen, there, there's been people who... You think if anybody could be discouraged, it'd be somebody where God plants them in a prison cell for a few years, you know, for, for, for living for the Lord. You read through the book of Acts, and you'll notice every once in a while it'll say, now, and Paul was in the prison for three years. And that's all it'll say. Can you imagine? Yeah, we, we, we get upset if our computer takes 10 seconds to load or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, try 10 years in a dirty prison. And yet... That was God's purpose. God was doing something with him and for him. and He was able to bless the Lord. He wrote one of the most joyous books of the New Testament from a prison cell, book of Philippians. What a joy to read that book. Yeah, can you imagine what you and I might have written? <laughs> the black letters or something, I don't know. Uh, but God has a plan, and he lays it out here in verse 27 and 28, or 28 and 29. He says... Uh, let's go to verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Some people like to talk about predestination, but they don't always like to label it for what it is. Predestination doesn't have to do with salvation. That's foreknow. God knows who's going to get saved. And he says, whom he did foreknow, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's God's plan for us. And God has a way that he's, he's doing that. Now, some of us cooperate with him more than others, but, uh, you know, uh, that's God's purpose and his plan. It says that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, he says. And then he says, verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. You know, God knows who's going to respond to his call. Let me encourage you tonight. Uh, when God calls, when, when God knocks on your heart's door, let him in. Let him in. Respond to his call. Uh, he says that, you know, it's unto all and upon all them that believe. That you can be saved if you'll trust the Lord, if you'll respond to his call. Uh, God looks down through eternity. He knows the past, present, future. And he sees who's going to respond to his call. And he, he knows, he makes sure that they're called. You know, I believe God's word goes out to everyone. And uh, whom he did foreknow, he predestinated to be conformed to Christ. Uh, those he predestinated, he calls. Uh, whom he called, them he also justified. You know, in a sense, even before we get saved, God says, okay, they're, they're righteous. <laughs> now, uh, don't go too far with that, but uh, justified means declared righteous. 
And then he puts it, them he also glorified. He's got a place in heaven for those that, that he sees are going are gonna to trust him. God has a purpose. Now let me encourage you. Right there in the middle is God's call. Make sure you respond to God's call. Uh, there's a similar progression in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, I want to read this. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 2, and verse 4. You, you might have noticed this before. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Do you see the similar progression there? Dead in sins, he calls us, we get saved. Uh, he, uh, he quickens us and raises us up and uh, makes us sit together in heavenly places in Christ and uh, uh, sets aside his, his riches that we're going to be receiving both now and, and in eternity. You know, God is the one who... Uh, makes a way and uh, puts us uh, toward that path and on that path of being like Jesus Christ. Um, God's working out his plan in you. Well, back in Romans chapter 8, we've, we've come to a question in verse 31. We just read through verse 30. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Place in heaven uh, for us. Verse 31. What should we then say to these things? Now, if I understand how words work. He's talking about what we've just read in Romans chapter 8. What are we going to say to these things? Yeah. Let me put it in a little different way. What is your life saying to the things of God? What is your life saying? What is your testimony to, uh, to others? Now, it, your testimony basically will be what you, how you're responding to the Lord. Um, what should we then say to these things? What is your life saying? Uh, these things, it, back in verse 28, he talked about all things. So all the things of your life. How are you responding to them? It's, it's amazing how many people will say they're Christians and yet never have any Christian responses. You know, as Christians, it doesn't mean we'll always do the right thing. But when we do the wrong thing, we should come under conviction about it. You know, God's Holy Spirit will poke us. And sometimes we should have a, a Christian response to something. <laughs> you know, really, uh, there's a great need for Christians who will just live simple, basic lives of faith and holiness. Amen. Yeah, we don't need super Christians. We just need people who will just do the, the basic uh, Christian things. I find a lot of people who claim to be Christians live no differently than the world. Their, their language is the, sway, it's the same. They curse just like everyone else. Uh, their morality is the same. They're living together. They're cheating and stealing and doing all the things that the world does. Uh, their music is the same. How they deal with problems is the same. Y you know, they collapse in a heap. And, you know, what kind of a, a testimony is that of, of, of trusting the Lord? Uh, I'll live for today, nor anxious be. Jesus, my Lord, I soon shall see. Uh, good selection, whoever picked that song tonight. Uh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, we don't have to live a life of frustration. We're living for eternity. We're not living for this life. If all my hair falls out and I'm bald, I can live with that. <laughs> yeah. If uh, my leg falls off and I, I can't walk, I can live with that. Yeah, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know. I mean, this is not it. Uh, we need to understand God has a purpose in our life, and, and it's not about. Here, it's not just about our body and, and the things of the flesh. It's about the spirit. Yeah, there's, there's times when we'll be troubled and discouraged and uh, unfortunately even sometimes worldly as Christians. But we need to stop and remember, what's my life saying about these things? God says in verse 14, we can be led by the spirit of God. And what an honor. <laughs> if you were to call in but you couldn't call in the human equivalent for a council, could you? Yeah, you, you could go to the top of the world and call in somebody to give you counsel. Listen, you've got the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, uh, he talks that we, need, we can be looking for God's glory to be revealed in us. 
The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is nothing compared to the good things God is doing. Uh, verse 24, uh, we can live with hope. We're saved by hope. Uh, we can accept the Holy Spirit's help, verse 26. Uh, he, he's there to help our infirmities. He's praying for us. We can believe God. Verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. I've often thought if we would just live that one verse, uh, we would have enthusiastic Christian lives. <laughs> uh, just that one verse. Uh, there's no discouragement. We don't have to be discouraged and frustrated. Heaven awaits us. The Holy Spirit is helping us. All things are working towards God's purpose. And then the last part of the chapter, he talks about nothing can separate us from the love of God. What a blessing. So, no condemnation, no obligation to the old nature, no frustration. Life should make sense. Life will make sense if you'll respond to these things by faith. Let's read on, verse 31. It's a series of questions. What should we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he asks a series of questions to show you, not these. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, what a, what a passage. Uh, freedom from fear, no separation. In these questions, uh, he, he also gives us answers. In verse uh, 31 there, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, the answer basically is, God is for us. And who cares who else is against us? <laughs> I mean, really, uh, who can defeat God? How has he shown he's for us? He, he says there in verse 32, he that spared not his own son. Now, that's part of the next question. But uh, God shows he's for us because he gave his only begotten son. The second question, verse 32, he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And he's saying there, if God would give you his son, what's he going to withhold that's, uh, that you need? It's like someone giving you this beautiful diamond and then begrudging you the, the bag that it came in or the box, you know. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? The answer is Christ died for us. Uh, since God gave us Jesus, uh, he's not going to withhold what we need. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mentioned this morning, got ahead of myself. Uh, uh, that word commendeth means placed together. God commendeth his love toward us. He put us and his love together in Jesus. What a beautiful picture that is. If he'll give us Jesus, what's he going to withhold? Then the next question there in verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And he answers it, it is God that justifieth. You may have noticed in the news, quite often you'll hear of people going to a higher court. They don't get the verdict they want. They go to a higher court. Let me tell you, this is the highest court. When God says there's no condemnation, there's no condemnation. When God says you're, you're right with him, listen, there, there's no higher court someone can take it, take it to. Uh, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God has justified us. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. God is not called the accuser of the brethren. Uh, in fact, God has said that he is the one who's, who's defending us. God cannot both accuse us and justify us. Uh, Romans 5.1, he, he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall lay anything? God is justified. Uh, anyone else's accusations don't matter. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The fourth question in verse 34, who is he that condemneth? Well, the answer is, Christ is interceding for us. Uh, similar to the last one, Christ can't both represent us and oppose us. He's interceding for us, it says there in, in verse 34. And he actually gives four things that Jesus is doing, has done or is doing. He died. You see it there? He died. You read it? It's risen again. He's at the right hand of God. He's ascended to heaven. And he's interceding for us. Uh, these four, this fourfold work of Christ uh, makes us secure. Uh, Jesus is, is doing what needs to be done. In, in 1 John, he puts it this way. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, that's who Jesus is. Uh, he's, uh, he's the propitiation. He's the covering for our sins. There's a couple of verses in Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 9 much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you follow what he's saying there? He's saying if, if God would reconcile you when you were his enemy, how much better is it going to be now that you're his son, his child? Yeah, if he would do that when you were a dirty, rotten sinner opposed to him, uh, much more being reconciled will be saved by his life. We're secure. He'll pr There's a verse we, we learned in uh, Quieting the Noisy Soul. Uh, I say I, I learned it. Um, where he says this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I love thinking about that verse. You now, what, what that says to me is, God is going to present me, and he's going to say, I am so happy to present Bill Bradley. I am just so pleased that he's my child. And he's going to say the same about every one of us. He's going to present us with exceeding joy. Now, I've had people, I'll be honest with you, there's people that I haven't been real happy to be around or to present or, you know, whatever. But that's not going to be the case with God. Now, what a blessing. He, he was... He can keep us from falling. He's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Wow. Uh, freedom from fear. Freedom from uh, all the things that uh, bother us. He'll present us with joy. Then the last question there in, uh, well, one of the last questions in Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Interestingly, he says who. He didn't say what. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He asks the question, then he inserts possible answers. You know, this or, or that kind of thing. Um, and most of those are things that we struggle with from time to time. Uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, and, and so on. And then he, he names others down in verse 38. But the answer basically is nothing can separate us from the love of God. It comes from Him. It's not something that's dependent on us. It's because of His character. And He talks there in verse 36 how that many Christians have been sheep for the slaughter. Yeah, only God knows and only time will tell how many people have died for trusting Christ. There are people every day who are being killed for trusting Christ, even today. Uh, but there's just been literally millions of people who've died because they've said, I believe in Christ, and I will not deny that. We, we've been accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, how can he say that? Why can he say that? I think it relates to what Paul said in Philippians 1.21 when he said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen, we're more than conquerors. We're more than just having Christ in, in our life now. Uh, we have him for eternity. It's eternal life. If someone uh, kills us like a sheep for the slaughter, we go to heaven. We're with the Lord. Uh, 
troubles and uh, how that verse go? Troubles and sorrow all pass. We will be home at last, you know. Uh, what a blessing it is. Uh, we live in victory. We die in victory. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. It made me think of 1 Corinthians 15, where he says in, uh, at the end of the chapter, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we're not under the law anymore. We don't have to fear death anymore. Uh, we have, uh, we have, are more than conquerors through Christ. Uh, let me encourage you this evening. This chapter is such a blessing as, as we see what God has done, what God's Holy Spirit uh, is doing in our lives. Uh, let me, number one, encourage you, make sure that according to the Bible that you are in Christ Jesus. And he starts the chapter saying, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's the most important relationship of eternity, is your relationship to the Lord, to God through Jesus. Make sure that you are in Christ Jesus, that you're saved. Secondly, live God's purpose. You know, God has a purpose. Uh, value God and his love more than anything or, or anyone else in life. Live for God's purpose in, in your life. Maybe ask yourself, what am I saying by my life? What is my testimony to others? What is my real belief about God? And then, thirdly, let me encourage you to believe God's security. Don't, don't base your assurance and your security on yourself or the things of this world. Uh, go to God's word for assurance. And no better place to start than Romans chapter 8. Uh, what a blessing to see God's attitude toward us. Uh, I've heard it said, and I think it's true, that after a person gets saved, God never calls us a sinner anymore. God calls us a saint. And what a blessing it is to know that, that that's God's attitude toward us. He, he's going to receive us with joy. And uh, we, can, we can know this because of what he's written. Do you know him today? Let's go to the, to the Lord in, in prayer. Maybe the Lord is, is speaking to your heart about an area of, uh, of difficulty that you've faced or faith or uh, whatever it might be. Listen, God can help you. God has answers. And uh, God is willing to uh, give you those answers through his word and his Holy Spirit and through the counsel of others. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we ask your blessing tonight. Help us to uh, believe what you've said here. Lord, help us as we go through our difficulties to look to you and what you might be doing in us and through us. Lord, thank you that this world isn't our home, but you have a place prepared for us in heaven. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that we would value what you value. And uh, Lord, help us to understand your word and to be like Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that that's not dependent on what we do. But Lord, we do want to obey you and cooperate with you. And I pray that you'd help us to do that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.